obligation or cost to you. Email spalmer at ksl.com. That's spalmer at ksl.com. Traffic and weather together brought to you by Sinclair's Dino Pay app. Save up to 20 cents per gallon. Here's Ricky Meese. Again, a reminder, Little Cottonwood Canyon closed at this time. We also have an accident, I-215 South Belt, near Redwood Road with the vehicles over to the shoulder. Zero res, get one room cleaned starting at just $25 with a four-room minimum and 25% off all other services. Use promo code CLEANWEEK, zero res. Ricky Meese in the KSL Traffic Center. KSL weather, more rain and snow showers today and tomorrow. Highs only in the 40s and cloudy with a chance of showers through the rest of the week. 41 degrees and cloudy right now. I'm Dan Bombas from the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. Listen online at kslnewsradio.com. We're Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. Inside Sources. Inside Sources. America's voice of reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. On Friday last week, the House of Representatives passed their version of the $1.2 trillion spending deal to fund the government through the end of September. And early in the morning hours on Saturday, about 2 a.m. Eastern Time, the Senate did the same. So have we put the shutdown showdown to bed and to rest, or is this just the end of the beginning of a new battle in Congress? Let's begin. Think you know the news of the day? Think again with Boyd Matheson on KSL News Radio. Well, a government shutdown was averted uh, in the early morning hours over the weekend, and that's a good thing. <laughs> We need to keep the government open. We need to keep things moving along. Process has been rocky and bumpy, to say the least, and it doesn't matter where you fall on the political spectrum. And so there's interesting conversations to be had in terms of where we are and what comes next. Uh, we turn to United States Congressman from the state of Utah, Blake Moore. He represents Utah's first congressional district, and he joins us live on the line on a Monday. Congressman, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. All right. So give us uh, some perspective in terms of how things played out going into the weekend. And of course, uh, this is really dealing with last year's spending package, which, which will get us to the end of September. And then, of course, there's a lot of work to be done between now and September 30th to make sure we're ready for what's next. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I like the way you presented that. And the answer is yes, there will continue to be many spending battles and there should. That's our job. Yeah. Um, and, and you say, and, and it, and the one thing I would change, though, is the, is the concept of when we finalize the appropriations packages, that's not averting a shutdown. That's actually doing our job and finalizing it. Mm. It's the CRs that we weren't able to get to the final. We weren't able to finalize things. We didn't have it done in time. And that's when you avert a shutdown is when you do a continuing resolution, which everybody laments and hates that process. And we actually use them as a way to continue the negotiations to get more of our, our wins, at least from the House majorities standpoint um but yeah we'll always continue to have have fights and and, and this one we that's what we've been doing uh in, in making sure that we get as, as as much out of this as we possibly uh, possibly can and i love the fact and when you know of the so it mentioned this is a 1.2 trillion dollar bill it's important for people to recognize two things our entire federal spending on an annual basis is over six trillion dollars so when you put it into perspective, oh, my goodness, there's all this other spending that we never even address. We never even vote on. It's called the mandatory budget. And those are programs that get enacted and never get. But you can never even criticize me for it because I'm not even required to vote on it. <laughs> right. I've, I've, I've introduced a bill that would change that and it would make so the entire budget is required to be voted on. But this one point two trillion, 75 percent of this mm -hmm. is for defense. It's for Hill Air Force Base. It's for making sure that our, our troops finally get a pay increase for what they've been really struggling with. And so this is a really, really good productive way and a good bill that, that, you know, we were able to get our defense equities taken care of. Um, and, and that's what has been missing from a lot of the conversation is this has been something the Republicans have been very supportive. We were able to, through this appropriations process, increase our focus on defense and it keeps stagnant or reduce and find areas of cuts from the non-defense side mm. of the budget, which is another win. Yeah, I think that those are all such important things for us to keep in mind because it is, it's is—it's so easy to get lost in the headlines of who won this or who battled for that. Uh, and the important thing is, as you said, Congressman, what is the job? Let's do that part first. You go through those appropriations bills and that process, you finalize it. 
uh, that's the way it's supposed to be done. It's the continuing resolutions where all the uh, uh, nefarious stuff begins to happen, I think. And uh, and so as you look at that moving forward, uh, I know you're part of a, of a group that is about serious lawmaking and doing the process because the process matters doing the process right, which always gets us to have those debates that you talked about. We want to have those battles out in front of the public uh, and make bills that have a chance to be amended and debated and then voted on so we can actually get to some accountability. What's your view in terms of where we go from here, and is there a path uh, to get back to that regular order and process? Yeah, we last year— um, we started to go down that path really well, and I think we made some good accomplishments, and we need to pick up where we left off. We passed – so there's 12 appropriations bills. Again, big picture, it's only 25% of our entire budget, right. and everybody wants to focus on it because it's the only thing we vote on. All the other stuff from Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, um, certain welfare programs, the interest we pay on the debt, all of that spending happens without any action from Congress. That just goes on on the direct side. of. Okay, but let's talk about – the you know the 25 percent we need to do as best by that as we possibly can we need to find areas of waste as, po- as we possibly can and we really started to do that last summer we passed individual appropriations so there's 12 total so from defense to veterans to labor uh, to energy and water to legislative branch to judicial that kind of thing so there's 12 book bills and we we started to just pass them on an individual basis and send them over to the senate now the senate usually does their thing where they group them all together And what the Senate typically does is they package them all into one big bill and then jam the House and send it back over to the House. Uh, It's been a tradition for several years. Right. And we we successfully were able to 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 kind of get out ahead of that and cut it in half, at least, Mm -hmm. and put, you know, six together, worked on those six, passed those a couple weeks ago, which to to not much fanfare, actually. But ironically, it was half of the appropriations process a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And then this week we just finished off the other half. uh, in a really strong defense bill, which should have been celebrated by more Republicans, but you know, that's the, that's the fun part about this job. It's always easier to just kind of vote no, and, and knowing that it's going to pass, and you vote no, and you avoid the avoid some of the you avoid some of the um, criticism, which is which is great. But it, it it's whatever. That's the stuff that makes me roll my eyes. Yeah, and, well, it also uh, puts you into that uh, vaunted flathead. Uh, <laughs> Flat Forehead Society, which is growing in numbers, sadly. Uh, I, I want to ask you quickly just about the uh, this other 75% of the budget because uh, I'm so glad you pointed this out because very few people are talking about this in a serious way. You have a lot of unserious conversations about Social Security and things like that, uh, but you have presented something that would require – Congress to weigh in on all of that, quote, mandatory spending uh, so that there is some accountability. Mandatory spending was only 25 percent of our budget back in 1965. It has now grown to over 71 percent of our total budget. It has actually crowded out all the things that we traditionally spend our tax revenues on, Mm. defense, homeland, veterans, um, things like that, of those 12 appropriations. So it is my biggest concern. And the fact that it grows so rapidly and we don't vote on it, we don't reform it, we don't do anything. I mean the last time we truly reformed Social Security was 1984. Mm. Our demographics are very different now. In 2008, that's when baby boomers started to retire. We weren't prepared for that, and it has added more debt, and it's grown that. So Medicare is very expensive, and it doesn't mean that we don't want it there. We have decided in the 20th century that we are going to um, have some income and health security for our seniors, and they have paid into the system. But it's, it, the, the, the math isn't working out anymore. Yeah. But, hey, it's tough politically. I get it. <laughs> yeah. So we've done two things. So I've done that bill, the, congressional, the Comprehensive Congressional Budget Act. Uh, I would love to see that get, get legs. It, 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 it's going to be you know, it's introduced this year. Um, I could see this. You know, it, it would need a whole other term to really gain steam. But it would, take, it would force us to take into consideration the entire budget, not just 25 percent that we always – sort of go back and forth over that doesn't drive debt. It doesn't actually solve any problems. And we have the debt commission. So we passed out of the budget committee a few weeks ago, the debt commission bill that is different than what you've seen before in like Simpson Bowles or whatever. This would actually create recommendations and force action in the house and in the Senate. And and that's something that can sort of force us to be adults and look at the big drivers of debt and, and solve those. This bill we passed on Friday. I mean, that's for our defense basically. Right. 
And that has not been a debt driver for our nation. Can we do it better? We always will. We will always keep working on that. Yeah. But we got to get after the other stuff. Yeah. Great perspective. And uh, you are absolutely correct. The math always wins. And there is the absolute predictability of consequences if we don't deal with it. So both of those bills you've introduced, uh, I think, are so important. And uh, we need to shed a little more light on those as well. Congressman Blake Moore, Utah's first congressional district. Thanks for joining us live today. Great perspective. And uh, we look forward to having you back soon to continue the conversation, a serious conversation to get to the serious results. Thanks for joining us. In time. Thank you. All right, again, that's uh, Congressman Blake Moore from Utah's 1st Congressional District. And uh, I love where the congressman landed uh, in terms of both of those elements, in terms of we have to get serious about the almost 75 percent that Congress doesn't even vote on. It's automatic spending. A lot of it's on interest payment on the debt, Social Security. But we've got to have conversations about that if we're going to get serious. We've got to think again about how we're doing this. These are two important steps from Congressman Blake Moore. We'll be right back. Think again on Inside Sources with Boyd Matheson. Derek Overstreet, founder of the New Millennium Group. We're a financial planning firm. Listen, we're fiduciaries. We have advisors standing by right now to take your call. That's 888-999-6370, 888-999-6370. The reason you're going to want to call is we're going to help you retire three to five years before you thought possible. Now, imagine how that would be if you could actually retire three to five years sooner than your plan was. The way we do this is by putting together a step-by-step plan, taking into consideration any rental properties that you have, any pension income that you have, your social security. Listen, we put that all together for you in writing. It will allow us to to build your income based on inflation. You know, inflation has been rapidly rising. You and I both need a plan that whatever we start out our income at, in five or 10 years, we're going to need 40% more income. So if you're one of those people listening and you'd like a plan in writing, give us a call at 888-999-6370. That's 888-999-6370 or go to utahsfinancialplanner.com. Wherever you find yourself on the road of life, the freeway blocked because of the jackknife truck trailer, it's better with guidance from the KSL traffic team. It looks like traffic there is starting to move again. Time your commute with traffic and weather together every 10 minutes on the nines, mornings and afternoons on KSL News Radio. Hi, this is Scott Trout of Cordell and Cordell. If you're a dad who is facing divorce, there are extra layers of stress that may include stereotypes and assumptions. No two situations are the same. Our legal experience and dedication prepare us for whatever legal challenges we face together. You need a partner you can count on. For more than 30 years, Cordell & Cordell has represented men in divorce. Offices in Midvale and Clearfield. 1412 South Legend Hills Drive, Suite 200, Clearfield, Utah, 84015. Online at CordellCordell.com. Getting your biggest tax refund from Jackson Hewitt can lead to some spirited reactions. Jackson Hewitt, yeah! Jackson Hewitt is so sure they'll get you your biggest refund that if they don't, you get your money back plus 100 bucks. Jackson Hewitt, yeah! Switch to Jackson Hewitt and we'll beat what you paid last year, even if you filed online. Hewitt, yeah! Ain't nothing to it. Switch to Jackson Hewitt and pay less for tax prep, guaranteed. Proof of prior year payment required when filing. New clients only at participating locations through April 7th. Terms at jacksonhewitt.com. Utah's strong winds can cause huge damage to your roof that you can't see. Your roof might need repair. Don't wait for a disaster. Call the masters at Master Roofing for an honest inspection at 801-383-0072. Specializing in small repairs, Master Roofing handles everything from patching holes to full roof replacements. Schedule your free assessment at masterroofingutah.com. Discover the best of senior living at Trio Orem and Trio South Ogden. Today's older adults aren't wrapping up their life's journey. They're seeking a new one. And Trio Independent Living is here to help them do just that. With a smart, modern, and connected lifestyle, residents cultivate relationships and maximize independence through signature programs like Prime Fit Wellness that bring living well and well-being to life. Welcome to the new age of senior living at Trio. Come on by for a visit today. It's been a rough winter for sure, but visitors are flocking to Box Elder County. Our feathered visitors, that is. Bear River Migratory Bird Refuge is busy hosting swans to swallows, geese to grebes. The spring migration is in full swing, and all that's missing is you. 
Box Elder County really is for the birds. Just a short 60 minutes north of Salt Lake, Box Elder County is the perfect place to make memories and celebrate spring, along with spending time with our feathered friends. You'll experience amazing restaurants and unique shopping. Come take a soak at Crystal Hot Springs, home to the highest mineral content of any natural hot springs in the world. Let the winter melt away as you relax and rejuvenate. Take in a theater performance at one of the live theaters or visit one of the fine museums. Visitors really are chirping all about Box Elder County. Check out visitboxeldercounty.com and see why Box Elder County is for the birds. That's boxeldercounty.com. Save up to 20 cents off per gallon using Sinclair's Dino Pay app. Find a Sinclair station, store amenities, purchase history, and enjoy a simple, secure way to pay for fuel. Download the free app. Over the years, you've brought opioids into your home. They helped when you were in pain, and you held on to them just in case. But holding on to opioids puts your family at risk. Learn more at www.fda.gov slash drug disposal. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bombas. First... Multiple crashes have closed the road in Little Cottonwood Canyon this afternoon. Second, former President Trump won a round in a New York appeals court this morning. He won't have to post the full amount of a civil judgment to appeal that case. And third, Florida has a new state law that prohibits social media accounts for kids 14 and under. Right now, 41 degrees and cloudy in Salt Lake City. Back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Get deeper insights on the news from Inside Sources. Welcome back to Inside Sources here on KSL News Radio. It's great to be with you today. As always, I am Boyd Matheson. If you missed the first segment of the show today, we had uh, Utah Representative Blake Moore from the 1st Congressional District on the line talking about some of the spending and uh, some of the processes that uh, are and are not happening in Congress these days. And one of the things that we concluded with, with uh, Representative Moore, was a bill he had introduced that would require the thing that we often don't talk about, and that is the almost 75 percent of the budget that Congress doesn't even vote on anymore, uh, which includes things like interest payment on the debt, Social Security, and so on. And getting to the point we have to have a conversation about that, but it's difficult uh, because of the politics and how unserious so many who are in Congress are about the topic. Uh, Eric Bame, of course, is a reporter at Reason, covers the economic policy, trade policy, and elections, has a great piece, as he always does, uh, delivering some great insight into the latest uh, budget plan that was rele- released and what happens when you try to do something to solve problems in Washington. And uh, it makes all of this pretty unserious in the end. And uh, Eric, welcome back to the show. Glad to be here, Boyd. Thanks for having me again. All right. Awesome. So uh, you talked today about the uh, the ideas within the uh, new budget plan uh, coming out from the Republican side, the House Republican Study Committee, uh, and particular talking about Social Security. So give us kind of the, the lineup in terms of what is in there, and then we'll get into why it's so hard to have a serious conversation in Washington these days. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, plaudits, first of all, for Representative Moore. I think his some of his proposals on reforming the budget process uh, certainly deserve uh, more of a look in D.C. Um, this uh, yeah, this story is about the, the Republican Study Committee budget uh, that was released last Wednesday. It's, uh, you know, it's 180 pages long. It's, a, you know, more of an aspirational document, really, than an actual budget document. I, I think that you can really compare it to uh, the president's budget proposal, you know, which, which gets introduced every year in Congress and members of Congress take a look at it, throw it in the trash can, and then go and, and write their own budget. It's kind of the same sort of thing. This is the Republicans' uh, version of that. And uh, in there, I mean, this is one detail in a, 180 pages, but, what, you know, the, the big detail that got a lot of attention in some headlines last week is a, a plan to raise the uh, Social Security eligibility age from uh, the current level of, of 67 years up to 69 years. Um, note that I say the Social Security eligibility age because I think this, this commonly gets referred to as the retirement age. <laughs> right. uh, it's not like the federal government tells you when you can retire or when you should retire. All this is is you know the age at which you become eligible to collect Social Security benefits. Uh, so uh, that you know drew quite a bit of, of attention and quite a bit of criticism from both the right and the left. This proposal just to nudge that age up by two years. Yeah, and so let's let's talk through what uh, what it actually said. And as you said, this is all aspirational components in, in terms of that. Uh, but the politics fallout uh, was swift, immediate, 
uh, and across the spectrum for a lot of political purposes, not policy purposes. Yeah, I mean, you immediately saw the way in which uh, Democrats in particular want to uh, demagogue on this issue heading into the election this year. Um, and of course, this is what's been going on, honestly, for years. It's one of the main reasons why uh, the, the Social Security and entitlement crises haven't been dealt with in Washington. Um, but, you know, the, the White House immediately put out a statement talking about how Republicans want to cut Social Security. Uh, they, they're not proposing a cut. They're just proposing that some people would not become eligible for it for two additional years, which, oh, like, OK, maybe that's a, a cut, but it's not uh, certainly not taking anything away uh, from anybody who's currently getting it. Um, and, and I think just, you know, the, the way in which this this criticism from the White House, from Democrats in Congress, from media, you know, particularly media on the left, uh, it really washes out the policy nuance here and the policy details, which really matter. Uh, this would be a two year, you know, phased in two year increase of the uh, of the retirement age or of the eligibility age for Social Security. Uh, it wouldn't affect anybody who's currently getting Social Security. It wouldn't affect anybody who's within uh, 10 or, or 15 years of collecting Social Security. Uh, and this is this is the lowest of low hanging fruits. If you're somebody who wants to actually keep this program solvent over the long term, um, we haven't mentioned it. In this conversation, but of course we've talked about it on this program here many times before, Boyd, and that is that you know Social Security is going to hit insolvency in the early 2030s, and uh, you know if you want to deal with that problem, one of the easiest and and the, probably the first step towards any sort of long-term solution is making some changes to the eligibility age. So this is in some ways uh, an inevitable solution or an inevitable partial solution, uh, and on the other hand, it's also impossible to do because there's just such a uh, such an, uh, an unwillingness uh, on both sides to engage seriously about this topic. Yeah, and the the reactions were just, and the reactions to the reactions are where it gets really crazy in my book, uh, because you have those that you know it's immediately pushing you know grandma off the cliff, it's you know kicking grandpa to the curb, uh, it's all of those things. Uh, but it's important to step back from those headlines to kind of have that think again moment of if we do nothing. Uh, then there will be there will be real cuts uh, when it hits insolvency. That is going to hurt grandma and grandpa and aunt and uncle and a host of others. Uh, but I think the the way you frame that, Eric, in terms of look, this is a a ten to fifteen year phase in. So no one who is currently on Social Security or no one who's within a fifteen year window uh, is going to be impacted on it. So everyone's going to have plenty of time to plan. Uh, for all of those things. And, and yet we so demonize, we so weaponize all of this. Uh, it, it makes me wonder, it makes me worry that uh, we don't have enough uh, that are serious uh, on the policy side anymore because they're too busy making sure the politics works out. And uh, we even saw this on the right. We saw uh, Senator Josh Hawley, you pointed this out in your piece at the Hill, uh, that uh, you know he played to this because of where he's positioning himself. Right. You mentioned, you know, it's not just the reaction, but then it's the reaction to the reaction. And I think that's where, you know, what, what Josh Hawley said is really a great example of that. Um, and so you've got, you know, Democrats on the, on the left who are saying, you know, immediately want to play politics with this. And then what Hawley said is he said that this is a horrible idea. I'm totally opposed to it. Uh, he told The Hill, uh, Republicans are so stupid if they want to go to working people and say, congratulations, you've paid into this your whole life, your payroll taxes, and now we're going to take part of it away from you. We're going to make you work even longer than we said beforehand. I think that's just the stupidest thing I've ever heard. That's him saying that, not me. <laughs> um, but uh, what, what he's really saying there is he's really saying – that this proposal will hurt Republicans' election prospects uh, in you know going forward. That's that's really what he's saying here. He's not making a policy argument. He's making entirely a political argument. And he may very well be right. I, I don't think you know. I, I think there's probably quite a bit of merit to that. Uh, but the prioritization there of of the political outcome ahead of the policy outcome, ahead of the the outcome uh, that will actually maintain this program or actually allow people who have paid into it to gain back uh, what they feel they, they are owed, uh, you know, that that sort of prioritization is the problem. Um, it, it may be true that Republicans will do better in elections for the next five to 10 years by saying Social Security is fine. We don't need to make any changes. Uh, but then you're going to hit the point nine or 10 years from now in which Social Security is obviously not fine and in which people suddenly see their benefit checks cut by uh, 23, 25 percent, something like that is the current estimate. Um, 
And then those voters are going to turn around and say, wait a minute, for the last 10 years, you've been telling us everything's fine. We don't need to make any changes. And now suddenly, obviously, things are not fine. So uh, it's, yeah, the, the prioritization of the politics above the policy uh, is a real problem. It's a problem for many things in Washington and a, many, a problem for many things in, in our politics. But I think this is one of the areas where that uh, disconnect is most apparent and most troubling. Yeah, no question about it. And uh, as you say, uh, the math always wins <laughs> in the end. Uh, there, it's in- inevitable. We have the absolute predictability of consequences to all of this if there isn't any action And, uh, Eric, we always appreciate you keeping us straight and sound in terms of what the policy has to get to uh, so that we can get past the politics of it all. And, uh, Eric, we appreciate that. I'm going to end with a little uh, Adlai Stevenson uh, because I think this applies so specifically to this particular conversation. He says, let's talk sense to the American people. Let's tell them the truth, that there are, are no gains without pains. We are now on the eve of great decisions, not easy decisions. What counts now is not just what we're against, but what we're for. Who leads us is less important than what leads us. And we got to get back to those principles and policies. Eric, as always, thanks for joining us on Inside Sources. Of course, I'll note that Adlai Stevenson lost both times he, he ran did. for president. <laughs> the so politics didn't work for him either. <laughs> yeah, of course. But thank you so much for having me, Boyd, as always. I think that's a really important message. Hey, thanks, Eric. Great stuff, as always, from Eric Bay from Reason. Reason.com. Check out his piece today. We'll step aside for bottom of the hour news. More inside sources coming up next. It's 1.30 at KSL News Radio. I'm Dan Bomas. KSL's top local story this hour. We have breaking news. Firefighters battling a two-alarm fire at an apartment building in Kearns. The building on Thorncrest Way includes 24 units. Residents are being evacuated. We've had no reports of injuries. KSL News Radio is sending a report of the scene. We'll have more information as soon as it becomes available. Our top national story this hour from ABC News. Former President Trump praised a decision from an appeals court that allows him to post a lower bond of $175 million to cover his $464 million civil fraud judgment. I respect the appellate division for substantially reducing that ridiculous amount of money that was put on by a corrupt judge. Another judge in the criminal case involving hush money payments has set a trial date of April 15th for the former president. Your money at this moment, the Dow Jones average down on the day, 163 points. The Nasdaq has slipped, and it's now down 21 points. And our KSL weather, the snow and rain showers will continue. That's next. KSL News Time 131. News doesn't just mean information or dates. It's the story of our local history being told in real time. Be a part of the story. This is Tim Hughes and Amanda Dixon. We hope to be a part of your story. We have you covered on KSL News Radio. This Monday Tax Tip is brought to you by Susan Spears, CEO of the Utah Association of CPAs. If you haven't already funded your retirement for 2023, do so by April 15th. That's the deadline for contributing to a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. Making the deductible contribution could help you lower your tax liability this year. To qualify for the full annual IRA deduction in 23, you must either one, not be eligible to participate in a company retirement plan, or two, if you're eligible, your adjusted gross income must be less than 73,000 for single or head of household filers, or 129,000 or less for couples filing jointly. The maximum IRA contribution you can make is 6,500, or 7,500 if you're 50 or older. Discuss your IRA deduction options with your CPA. Get the most out of your income tax preparation when you hire a CPA. Go to uacpa.org to find a CPA that's right for you. Listen to KSL on Monday for more tax tips from the Utah Association of CPAs. Good morning. I'm the 40% off window company. 40% off? Of what? Hey, 40% off. Yeah, I'll bet it's your biggest sale of the year. This week only, because you need a model home in our neighborhood. Well... Well, nothing. It's baloney. Hi, this is Kathy. And Doug of Window World. When you hear those things, you know you've entered the baloney zone. Resist the force of the baloney zone. Find Window World online at windowworldutah.com. Or call Window World at 281-8111. That's 281-8111. And that's no baloney. 
Jeff Kaplan. When I was a kid, my parents got me a subscription to Newsweek magazine. I would devour every page into the night. And to this day, I sit on my iPad looking for stories for my minute of news, flesh out our coverage, and I get to share the news with you. Jeff Kaplan's Afternoon News, 3 to 7 on KSL News Radio. Traffic and weather together now brought to you by Sinclair's Dino Pay app. Save up to 20 cents per gallon. Here's Ricky Meeks. We have received an update from the UDOT Cottonwood Canyons. They are hoping to open Little Cottonwood Canyon around 215 in the valley. Snowfall continues on the east side, making for a messy drive along I-215's east belt. New deals are blooming at Murdoch Hyundai. Pick your new car at the spring sales event. Receive 0% for three years on the Tucson or lease a new Elantra for only $199. Ricky Meese in the KSL Traffic Center. And our KSL weather, more rain and snow showers today and tomorrow. Highs only in the 40s. It'll be cloudy with a chance of showers through the rest of the week. Right now, 39 degrees with some light rain in Salt Lake. I'm Dan Bomas from the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. Listen online at kslnewsradio.com. We're Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. Inside Sources. Inside, Inside Sources. America's voice of reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Well, as we continue to move deeper into the 2024 election season, the results of the race could come down to things we often talk about are the essentials for a campaign, time, and money. Today, we're going to talk about campaign cash. The dollars don't lie, and in an election that will be close, following the money uh, can be a real determining factor and could be a good indicator, good predictor of the outcome. And so as we look at the dollars and cents of it all, Brett Samuels, of course, is the White House reporter for The Hill, covers both President Biden and uh, Donald Trump's re-election campaigns and a great piece uh, at thehill.com. Brett, uh, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back, Boyd. All right. Uh, so let's talk about the uh, the cash race. Some of the uh, numbers that came out uh, at the end of uh, the quarter there. Uh, very interesting and pretty telling in terms of where the dollars and cents are flowing. Yeah. So as you mentioned, you know, obviously looking at these financial reports, you get a pretty good sense of, um, you know, the resources these campaigns have to work with as we head toward what is shaping it to be a, a marathon general election campaign, really. And what we're seeing is President Biden and his campaign, the DNC, have a pretty sizable cash advantage over Donald Trump, the RNC, and their operation uh, as we really get into the general election campaign here. Um, you know, former President Trump has obviously struggled with having to pay legal bills out of his uh, campaign coffers, and that has hurt him to an extent. But, uh, you know, that aside, just the sheer amount um, Trump and his campaign uh, entered March with about uh, $20 million total on hand, um, or raised about $20 million total, I should say, uh, whereas the Biden campaign had raised you know, well over $100 million, uh, his full operation. So so quite the disparity there as, as we uh, head into March and head into the home stretch of this campaign. Yeah, so fascinating to look at all of that. And uh, obviously with the former president uh, spending a big chunk of that on legal matters, Help us understand that. Just kind of unpack it a little bit in terms of how those dollars are going to impact the race, especially as we get to you know past summer and into the fall. Uh, again, in tight race uh, in a lot of those swing states, uh, how is that uh, dollars difference between the two campaigns uh, going to play out? Yeah, well, so there's a few ways that that uh, former President Trump and his need to pay his lawyers and his legal bills will potentially impact his campaign. We've seen. Um, in 2023, his political uh, fundraising committee spent about $50 million total over the whole year on legal fees. Uh, so, you know, certainly if, if you anticipate a similar cost this year, given that he's facing these four investigations uh, and various other legal uh, legal issues, he's, you know, looking to face another tens of millions of dollars in legal bills this year. Uh, so that comes out of his campaign coffers. That's money that he's not able to spend on uh, you know, ads, infrastructure, things of that nature. Um, and additionally, there's this idea that some Republican donors may be skeptical to give money to the Trump campaign because they may think, you know, if this money is going ultimately to pay for the former president's legal bills, maybe my money is better spent supporting a different candidate, supporting, you know, a different Republican effort, conservative effort, 
Um, so I think we're going to continue to see this play out over the course of the year, this sort of push and pull between Trump and his need for more campaign cash uh, and sort of the issue of, of having some of that money uh, essentially go into legal fees. Yeah, and uh, I want to I want to dig into that just a little bit as you talk about some of those big donors uh, and where they're deciding if they do get to the point in the fall where they say, hey, this is this is all legal bill stuff. This is not really moving the needle. Uh, and they pull that back, or if they reallocate that one, we know some have already to say, you know what, we're not going to focus on the presidential. We're going to focus down ballot, maybe on some of the Senate races or House races, or even down into the state level uh, kinds of races. Give us some dynamic there in terms of uh, what some of those big donors are looking at. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this has been sort of uh, really since Nikki Haley dropped out of the race a few weeks ago has been something uh, that folks have been tracking because a lot of her donors have been skeptical to fall in line behind Trump, even though he's now the presumptive Republican nominee. So these donors have a decision to make. As you said, they could you know, just donate directly to down ballot candidates, be it Senate, governor, House candidates. Um, you know, They could donate directly to the RNC, but of course the RNC is now merged with the Trump campaign, so that's sort of one operation. Um, you know, they could they could look for other other means to uh, to use their dollars essentially to to uh, you know show where they stand on these issues. But Trump is is holding a fundraiser in early April where he's trying to rally some big donors to his side. Um, and I think as the race tightens and as we get to the conventions and beyond, there will be this increasing push and increasing urgency certainly from the Trump campaign. Uh, if if those donors have in fact still held out and have not have not fallen in line behind the former president. Yeah, so interesting. And we were discussing last week uh, that the Trump campaign has actually fall, followed something that uh, President Obama was criticized for, uh, and that was kind of taking over <laughs> the the DNC for President Obama. Uh, and that while that did ensure a, a re-election in eight years in the White House, uh, it really hurt the Democrats uh, over time because uh, it had become such an Obama-centric organization. Are we seeing... Are we seeing history repeat itself here now just on the Republican side when it comes to the RNC? Yeah, it's an interesting comparison. Certainly, uh, former President Trump has very quickly remade the RNC to uh, essentially leadership is entirely his allies, folks that he favors, folks that his uh, top campaign advisor, Chris Lasazita, has appointed to leadership positions. Um, obviously, the new chair and co-chair, Michael Watley and Laura Trump, uh, were Trump's uh, the former President Trump's picks to to lead the organization in place of Ronna McDaniel. So uh, certainly he's basically molded the RNC to his liking. It's all his people there. They've sort of reshuffled and reorganized the priorities to match the former president's priorities, to focus more on election integrity, um, being ready to go on offense with lawsuits if needed. Um, so this is something certainly, and especially if uh, Trump is not successful in winning this election in November, uh, you know, I think Republicans are going to have to reassess the RNC, reassess uh, who's running it, what the priorities are. And, uh, you know, certainly it's just another indicator that it's fully Trump's party. But but that does come with risks in the long term. Yeah. And then uh, finally, just in our uh, last minute here, anything else you're keeping your eye on, Brad, especially when it comes to kind of the dollars and cents of it all? Uh, and as we get into March, April, through the summer and then on into the fall general election. Yeah, well, certainly President Biden has been uh, doing a big fundraising blitz. Uh, he's got an event later this week where he'll have a big fundraiser in New York with former President Obama and former President Clinton. Uh, so that's expected to bring in big money. And the Biden campaign, you know, they have this big advantage. They're running ads. They're trying to take advantage of their big, uh, the big money disparity here. But keep in mind, you know, in 2016, Hillary Clinton outraised and outspent Donald Trump in 2016, and it didn't guarantee her victory, obviously. So um, you know, not a sure thing that, that Biden's big cash advantage will translate to an electoral victory. But, uh, you know, his campaign is certainly not leaving anything to chance trying to to run up the financial score on Donald Trump here. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm so glad you raised that point. Uh, we often talk about it in the context of uh, cash flow uh, often covers a multitude of problems inside of a campaign. I think we saw that in the Hillary Clinton example that you mentioned, uh, that sometimes those big dollars end up getting wasted or they prevent you from dealing with some of the bigger issues, maybe a little closer to the voters. A great perspective, as always, Brett Samuels, White House reporter for The Hill, covers both President Biden, former President Donald Trump, and the campaign of 2024. Great piece in The Hill. Check that out at thehill.com. Uh, Brett, th thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Boyd. Appreciate it.
All right, again, that's Brett Samuels, White House reporter for The Hill. And uh, the dollars and cents is always interesting. Uh, and as we've often said on this show, it, look, it really comes down to those those resources. And the biggest resources, the most important resources you have are time and money. And so how you spend your time and how you spend your money is really indicative of where your priorities are, where you think you're vulnerable, where you think your greatest opportunities are. And uh, it is very clear at this stage of the game that current president Joe Biden has a big dollars and cents advantage over the former tr- president. As Brett mentioned, uh, doesn't always parlay into actual victories. Hillary Clinton's a good example of that. Uh, the question will be, will there be enough in the Trump campaign coffers to get to the finish line, to get the voters out, especially in some of those swing states. We'll continue to watch all of that from both the Biden and the Trump campaign perspective. We'll step aside for a quick break. Come back with more Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Coming up next, stick around. Believe it or not, it's time for spring cleaning. Beat the spring cleaning rush with big savings and priority booking today. You're not the only one who's tired of winter this year. Your carpets are too. With Zero Res's platinum rated cleaning systems and environmentally friendly ZR water, they'll extract all that nasty out so your home will look and smell like a home should. With their no residue difference, it's what separates Zero Res from the competition. Just check out the 3,300 raving customer reviews online with a 4.8 Google rating and see what the hype is all about. Right now, get one room of carpet cleaning starting at just $25 with a four-room minimum. And also take 25% off all other services like air ducts, tile, upholstery, and rugs by using promo code CLEANWEEK to celebrate Utah's Cleaning Week. You owe it to yourself and your family to breathe healthy, happy, and clean. Call Zero Res right now, 801-288-9376. Or go online to ZeroRes.com and say you want the Clean Week special. Zero Res. Spell it backwards or forwards. It's the right way to clean. Intermountain Medical Center in Murray, LDS Hospital in Salt Lake City, and Utah Valley Hospital in Provo are ranked among the 2023 list for best cancer hospitals in the nation by Newsweek Magazine with a high level of comprehensive personalized care and treatment they provide. Intermountain Cancer Center locations provide an integrated, personalized approach to cancer treatment care, close to home for patients throughout the Intermountain West, as well as telehealth services. Brought to you by Intermountain Health and KSL News Radio. Odds are, if you have a 401k, it's set up with your payroll provider or an insurance company. I'm Jeff Jr. with Trajan Wealth, and if you're using your payroll provider or an insurance company for your 401k, the employer may be overpaying for the plan, the employees may have blasé investment options, and those blasé investment options may cost more than they should. Not with Trajan Wealth. Call us today, 801-899-7600. That's 801-899-7600. Services offered through a third-party partner. Devotion to country, service to Utah. Brent Oren Hatch had a front-row seat, watching his father serve our state faithfully in the Senate. A constitutional conservative and lifelong Republican, Brent Oren Hatch is a champion for the rule of law. He's running for Senate to stop this lawless president from destroying our country from within. Hatch will fight to secure the border once and for all and take on Mexican drug cartels to halt the flow of deadly fentanyl. Brent Oren Hatch knows the national debt is just as big a threat to national security. Hatch won't rest until the budget's balanced and won't cave to the big spenders in both parties. Pro-life, deeply committed to religious liberty, rock-solid Utah conservative. Brent Oren Hatch for Senate. Paid for by Conservative Outsider PAC, which is responsible for the content of this advertising. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. www.copac.us Three days only. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Save thousands on hot tubs and swim spas. It's a major manufacturer's liquidation of hundreds of in-stock spas. Utah State Fair Park. Hot tubs discounted 40 to 80% to the lowest possible price. Starting at $29.99. Free professional delivery. Take possession tomorrow, next week, next month, or next season. The hot tub and swim spa sale. Utah State Fair Park. Shop over a dozen models of swim spas from 11 feet to over 19 feet. Swim spas offer low-impact exercise, active family fun, unsurpassed relaxation, and installation in one day. The hot tub and swim spa sale. Everything must go. Free parking, free admission. You can't afford to miss this. It's a major manufacturer's liquidation of hundreds of in-stock spas. Friday, noon to 8 p.m. Saturday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Sunday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. The hot tub and swim spa sale. Utah State Fair Park. 
Visit HotTubAndSwimSpaSale.com. Attention pet parents. Tired of being a doorman to your furry friends? Say hello to Utah's own Pet Door Products. Your ticket to convenience and freedom. Visit PetDoorProducts.com. That's PetDoorProducts.com. Tim and Amanda. Do I look forward to reporting the news? Yes, insofar as it helps me understand what's happening. We know that it's important information that's going to impact people's lives, and so that makes the job of reporting the news that day easier. Utah's Morning News, between 5 and 9 on KSL News Radio. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bomas. First, residents of the Thorncrest Apartments in Kearns were evacuated when a two-alarm fire broke out in their building. Second, Utah State's men's basketball team lost to Purdue in the second round of the NCAA tournament, while head coach Danny Sprinkle has apparently won himself a new job at the University of Washington. And third, former President Trump won't have to put up the full amount of a civil judgment to appeal the fraud case against him, but he's still liable to pay almost half a billion dollars if he loses. 39 degrees, light rain right now in Salt Lake City. Back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Hear elevated conversation on crucial issues. Boyd Matheson on Inside Sources. Last week, Utah Valley University hosted a conference talking about one of our favorite topics, the First Amendment, in a kind of a different way, a little think again kind of moment. So I want to go back to one of those conversations I had with Professor Carson Holloway from the University of Nebraska at Omaha. I asked him about his experience at the conference, his time with the students, and the origins of the First Amendment to our Constitution. Here's how he described it. We had a good discussion this morning for students in which we talked about the kind of English common law origins of those rights and then how they were incorporated into the American Constitution uh, upon the amendment to the Constitution and the First Amendment, um, and how they function in our political society, and how they, you know, both how they function in politics and how they are used for uh, citizens to influence political outcomes, but also how important they are to civil society and um, the development of uh, private associations that, that, you know, do all kinds of things that the government really can't do in a large and diverse society like ours, like promote education, promote religion, promote science. Uh, There's so much that's done under the rubric of freedom of association and freedom of assembly that we don't think about. So we're trying to bring some attention to that. Yeah, I think that's so vital. Uh, We talked about it earlier that uh, this, uh, I think what Tocqueville described as the secret sauce of (laughs) the country was that Mm -hmm. free association and civil society and people coming together, not because of a government mandate or threat, uh, but because that's what people do. Uh, And so as you look at how we apply that in today's world, uh, with your conversation with the students, how do they see it playing out in their lives, which are so digitally driven, uh, the association mm-hmm. parts come, becoming a little bit different? Yeah, that's a very interesting point. And I have to say, as an aside, I'm happy to be on a program where we can talk about de Tocqueville. doesn't happen very <laughs> often. Um, I think the students are facing a very different situation. Uh, hopefully it will continue uh, to function in the way that we've had in the past. But as you pointed out, in the digital age, there's, it's a dual-edged sword, right? It's, yeah. it's a potential for greater isolation if people aren't meeting in person. And we've had experience of that through the pandemic and other kind of emergencies, I guess, that not they maybe force us or they encourage us to interact more digitally than we would in person. Um, but at the same time, it's also a, a way of communicating with people who agree with you. And that's what the f- spirit of association that Tocqueville talked about was centered on, right? That mm. people through newspapers in his account, uh, he says newspapers are essential to the spirit of association because it's through newspapers that citizens in a big, diverse democracy learn that there are other people who share their uh, convictions or share their interests, and then they learn to cooperate on that basis. So I think the students, the upcoming generation, it's important to educate them on this because uh, they're the ones who are going to have to uh, turn digital technology to a good purpose if it can be turned to it. I think it can. It's just yeah. take an act of discipline. This is basically another version, I think, of the same problem Tocqueville was talking about, that in a modern democracy, people tend to be isolated and to be weak on their own, so they need to unite if they're going to make mm-hmm. any difference in their communities. And uh, the newspaper was the technology of the time uh, when he wrote his book. And now we have other things that will have to be used in this way. Yeah, uh, that's so powerful. And, and I'm so glad you, you raised that component. We, we call this a gathering every, uh, every day here on Inside mm-hmm. Sources, that we can come sure. together. And, uh, and we, we only talk about politics so we can explore society and we explore society so we can get to the principles 
uh, and the people in America who actually live them every day. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things that has been part of your work, I, I want to spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, you and your uh, tag team partner and colleague, Brad Wilson, mm -hmm. uh, are co-editors of those principles, the political writings of George Washington, the political writings of Alexander Hamilton. Give us a sense of that project. And uh, I, I think with Washington in particular, I don't think as many people focus on his political thought, the principles that drove a lot mm -hmm. of the behavior we celebrate. The, what did you learn in that process? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm happy to be able to talk about those. We did the Hamilton volumes first, and then the Washington volumes came out just last fall from Cambridge University Press. And the aim in both, and there's actually a longer series that we are um, co-editors of where we're uh, recruiting other scholars to do other founders and other important statesmen in American history. So there will be more books of that kind coming in the future. But uh, w when we put those together, the idea was that there are already existing collections of their writings that are kind of generic, if I can put it that way, and we wanted to focus on the political writings. Um, and so everything that is political uh, is the starting point for those volumes, and especially things that operate at the level of principle or prudence, where they're trying to decide how to apply principles to concrete situations, how to act wisely in those situations. Um, so that's still there's a lot of material, two volumes for each one of them. And I'm glad you mentioned Washington in particular, because for me, somebody who's interested in political theory, constitutional law, you tend at first to gravitate toward other people like Madison, Hamilton, Jefferson, because yeah. they are more theoretical thinkers than Washington. But when you find out or what you find out when you dig into Washington is that although he's not a theoretical man the way they are, he's more of a practical guy. He is a very astute and responsible and sober and prudent man. And that's part of the pleasure, I think, of reading through all of these things where he grapples with these situations. It really is impressive. I, I think it's fair to say, based upon my reading of him, that this is a man who deserved his reputation at the time of the founding. He is a man who tried seriously to figure out in every instance what the right thing to do was, mm. and then to do it uh, as conscientiously as he could. So it's it's a an elevating experience to read his writings. Yeah, uh, I, I love that. And I love that whole idea of, of principle and prudence. Uh, we need a lot more mm -hmm. of that in the world today. Uh, give me one thing that uh, that surprised you in, in digging so deeply into those political writings, that political thought. Uh, what surprised you? Uh, where did you learn about Washington in terms of some of those driving and animating principles and mm -hmm. the prudence, that self-restraint in terms of how they were applied? Well, one thing that I learned about him that I still like to think about, and I'd like to figure out more definitively than I have, but one thing I learned about him that is interesting and important is that he thought a lot about his own reputation and was very protective of it. But I think if you attend carefully to what he said and how he acted, it wasn't in a selfish manner, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you, I said to somebody at this conference earlier today, when I read him, a long time ago when I was younger, I got the impression that this is a man who's somewhat prickly about his reputation, very protective of it. But as I, at a more mature age, when I reread what he had to say and how he thought about these things, I could see that a lot of his concern with his own reputation was actually concerned with setting a good example for the community. Mm. Um, for example, he thought long and hard about whether he would even st uh, be president of the United States because when he retired from public life, he had made a commitment that he was retiring, and this will be the last you hear from me. I mean, politicians today don't think much about breaking their promises, it seems like, or reversing themselves on yeah. earlier decisions, whereas he, it bothered him that people might think that he was merely grasping for power. And I think that's partly normal you know, human self-interest. You don't like people to think negatively about you. But I think also what was going on was that he took seriously the idea that a statesman has to also be a kind of moral and ethical educator of the people. He wrote a lot of letters. As you can imagine, he got a lot of letters from people congratulating him on uh, attaining to the presidency. And when he would write back to these associations, again, like churches, um, colleges, universities, organizations, uh, when he would write back to them, he would always use those letters as a chance to kind of reaffirm the virtues that are necessary for a society like ours, patriotism, honesty, respect for law. And I think he did take seriously that role as public teacher. And I think that's part of the reason he was also concerned about his own reputation, always trying to do the right thing and be 
being seen as doing the right thing. Yeah, so important. I, I always go back to his uh, first inaugural address uh, when he said that he hoped that the foundation of our national policy will be laid in mm-hmm. the pure and immutable principles of private morality and then called yes. on that free government to exemplify the attributes that would make the citizens mm-hmm. proud and, and command the respect of the world. And I think that respect was such a uh, an important thing. Uh, finally, before I let you go, because I know you got to get warmed up for uh, for your next conversation down there at Utah Valley University, we're thrilled to have you in mm-hmm. the Beehive State today. Uh, give us one thing that we all ought to maybe think again about uh, or think differently about, uh, whether that's about the uh, the First Amendment uh, and that uh, right mm-hmm. to assemble or uh, or George Washington and some of that political thought. Yeah, I think something that's very important for us to think about these days, which are days of polarization, is and this is something we can learn from Washington. We have to step back a little bit and try to respect other people who disagree with us and try to under th- understand things from their point of view. In the next event, we're going to talk about Washington's efforts to grapple with the bitter disagreements between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson in his cabinet. And he wrote some very nice letters to those guys <laughs> near the end in which he admonished them and said, there will be disagreements. Uh, government is like that. Politics yeah. is like that. It's inevitable. There needs to be, he said, more charity and more liberal allowances between people who disagree with each other. Mm -hmm. So he was giving that advice at the beginning of our country to people operating at the highest levels. I think we can all agree that it's still relevant now for everybody uh, in all walks of life, but especially in politics. Hour number two of Inside Sources coming up next on KSL News Radio. My sit down conversation with former Governor Mike Levitt. The past is prologue. Check that out coming up next. Stick around. KSL FM Midvale. KSL Salt Lake City. From the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. This is KSL News Radio. Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. It's 2 o'clock at KSL News Radio. I'm Dan Bonas. KSL's top story this hour. 24 units of the Thorncrest Apartments were evacuated this afternoon when a two-alarm fire broke out in the building. KSL News Radio's Eric Cabrera is there on the scene and joins us live. Eric? That's right, Dan. Uh, it's definitely a scene out here in Kearns. Uh, the fire department uh, has uh, Cougar Lane, which is the street just outside of the apartments, blocked off in both directions. Uh, the good news is the fire is out. Um, there are residents out here in the sidewalk in their cars. I even saw a resident without shoes. And that explains how quickly everyone was asked to evacuate. Uh, from what I've seen, the fire happened on a top floor apartment that's receiving exterior construction. So far, we haven't confirmed the source, but I'll be speaking with the public officer shortly to get more details. Uh, but from speaking with people here on the scene, thankfully, nobody was hurt. Reporting live from Kearns, Eric Cabrera, KSL News Radio. Our top national story this hour from ABC News. Federal judge in New York has denied a motion to delay the hush money case against former President Donald Trump. Uh, Judge Juan Merchant instead ordered the trial to begin with jury selection April 15th. They could have started this when I left office. You could have gone back three years, more than that. When I left office, all of these things could have been started so we wouldn't be quibbling over starting this week or that week or two days or three days. It wouldn't have mattered. This thing would have been over two years ago. The former president did win a round in New York appeals court. Earlier in the day, he won't have to put up the full amount of a civil judgment against him to appeal that case. Your money at this moment, the Dow Jones average down on the day 162 points. The NASDAQ is down 44. And our KSL weather, the uh, showers aren't going to quit just yet. We'll have that next. KSL News Time 202. You know what's great about KSL's traffic coverage? Trained traffic reporters and real listeners. Trading information and making the commute safer and faster for everyone. Every 10 minutes on the nines. We have you covered on KSL News Radio. Rick at loansbyrick.com has some important information for anyone in Utah and Idaho who's thinking of buying a house. Do it now. Don't wait until summer because home prices in those two states will likely increase by 10 to 20% due to in-migration from California and other states. 
That means a house that costs 400,000 right now will go up by 40 to 80 grand with multiple offers. Interest rates may drop later in the year, possibly to the 6% range, but the increased cost of the home will mean that your monthly payments will go up by a lot. So start looking and buy now. Refinance when the interest rates go down. Waiting to buy your home will only hurt you in the long run. For more details and buying strategies, call Rick at loansbyrick.com right now. 801-809-SAVE. Rick can evaluate your situation and get you on the path to buying a home today. 801-809-SAVE or click loansbyrick.com. Rick Kirschbaum, NMLS 241179 and Vintage Lending, NMLS 287106 are equal housing lenders. Some restrictions apply. Do you enjoy fishing, hunting, or just soaking in the beautiful outdoors? Then you need to check out the KSL Outdoors Show airing Saturdays at 6.30 p.m. and midnight on KSL 5 TV. Outdoors with me, Adam Eagle, is a unique show that takes viewers on a journey through Utah's beautiful backcountry. Watch it live every weekend or find the Outdoor Show on YouTube, ksloutdoors.com, Facebook, and Instagram. It's the KSL Outdoors Show brought to you by Camp Chef. Hi, I'm Henry Winkler. My eyes are very important to me. My eyes connect me with everything I love. I loved my late father-in-law dearly. He always lit up a room, but his vision dimmed with age. He had age-related macular degeneration, or AMD. And since partnering with Apellus, I've learned there's an advanced form of dry AMD called geographic atrophy, or GA. His struggle with vision loss made me want to help others know about GA's warning signs. For some, colors appear dull or washed out. For others, hazy or blurred vision make it hard to see details, like fine print on price tags. Many have trouble seeing in the dark, making driving at night difficult. GA gets worse over time and cannot be reversed. If you think you have GA, don't wait. Treatments are available. Ask a retina specialist about FDA-approved treatments for GA. And go to gawon'twait.com. Traffic and weather together brought to you by Sinclair's Dino Pay app. Save up to 20 cents per gallon. Here's Ricky Meese. Looks like it's open. I'm seeing traffic moving in both directions on Little Cottonwood Canyon at this time. Also an accident. We've had snow come through and dump, making a mess of I-80, I-215, and Foothill in that vicinity with an accident northbound on the east belt just after 33rd South. Zero res, get one room cleaned, starting at just $25 with a four-room minimum and 25% off all other services. Use promo code Clean Week, Zero Res. Ricky Meese in the KSL Traffic Center. And our KSL weather, more rain and snow showers today and tomorrow. High is only in the 40s. It'll be cloudy with a chance of showers through the rest of the week. 45 degrees, mostly cloudy right now. I'm Dan Bombas from the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. Listen online at kslnewsradio.com. We're Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. Inside Sources. Inside Sources. America's voice of reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. We often talk about the need we have in the country for real leadership and what that looks like, what that sounds like, and more importantly, what that acts like. I think there's a, a lack of that in so many places and spaces, whether it's in government, political office, even in our business community. Uh, the need for real leaders is great because there are big challenges, there are big things ahead, and it's time to rethink a little bit about what we think about the past in order to learn a think again moment for the future. Let's begin. Think you know the news of the day? Think again with Boyd Matheson on KSL News Radio. Well, the backstory of this actually started when a long, long time ago, uh, when I was about 12 years old. My father was elected to the legislature, mm. and uh, I was able to spend one week each year with him, mm. shadowing him as a state legislator. Yeah. But the deal was, uh, if I did so, I had to write a report on what I learned and what I observed. And I think it was in the spirit of that experience mm -hmm. that I began years ago thinking I need to do something to repay the great mm -hmm. privilege of doing public service. And a way might be to say, um, 
what did I learn and yeah. what did I observe? <laughs> and uh, it's taken a while, but I've I concluded this. I just need to put it out there while it might have some value. Yeah, well, value it definitely has, and it's so interesting to look back at your time in public office and public service, uh, and it really is so interesting the parallels from where things were when you were in elected office to where we are today. There's a lot of similarities. I, one of the things that occurred to me as I was assembling this is that everything I had written about in terms of the things that we worked on, the changes that were made during the time of my service that I think made a difference for 25 years or more, they're all happening again. <laughs> uh, we worked on the Olympics. We're going to have the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, we were building highways. We need to build highways again. Yeah. We worked hard to make Utah technology capital. Uh, we, we were going through the introduction of the information age hmm. uh, we're now going into the AI age and yeah. what did we learn from that we were struggling with all kinds of issues that are repeating themselves today hmm. and I I think that's the value of looking yeah. back it's not what happened in the past that's important yeah it's what can we learn from that that allows us to meet the challenges of today and all of these challenges will have to be met in slightly different ways because the circumstances are different yeah and this is clearly not a uh, sit on the rocking chair looking backwards uh, kind of exercise this is a forward-facing uh, past is prologue kind of approach uh, and one of the things that has been driving a lot of your conversation is what you like to call the the big gear principle explain that for us well another observation that I made of my experiences in public leadership is that there are hundreds of things, thousands of things you could take on, but you have a limited amount of time and bandwidth, and the state has limited amounts that it can invest in certain projects. So what do you focus on? And I began to realize that there are certain issues that have big cascading consequences. I, I like to tell the story of a, a clock that is in the governor's residence even today and we were uh, having it repaired and one of my children, my daughter, was looking at it and the clock repair person said, let me show you how this works. And he referred to all of the gears that started about the size of a dime and got much, much bigger until there was the one at the top about the size of a bike sprocket. He said, try to move the little gears. And she took her fingers and tried to move them and couldn't and she said, they're all caught. And he said, now move the big one. And so she turned the big gear and he said, what happens to the little gears? And she said, they all spin. <laughs> and that was a, just a great metaphor to me yeah. of, of what happens in society. We, yeah. For example, the Olympics, it was a big gear. Yeah. Not because we put on a big event and we did it successfully, but all the things that happened in the preparation mm. for the Olympics. I think about the information age and moving and what we actually had to do to successfully become good enough to succeed. Uh, I've thought about rural Utah. I think about the sophistication of rural Utah today in terms of its capacity to be part of the modern economy and where it was 25 years ago. Yeah. It is profound. And so all of those changes of the big gear mm. have uh, caused all of the little gears to align. Yeah, well, we're gonna get in and talk about some of those specific gears, but before we go to break, just uh, uh, one minute on this whole idea of change. You have a pretty interesting philosophy in terms of how we can look at it, deal with it, and actually benefit from it. I've, I think all of this is about change. Yeah. Uh, I remember, uh, I, I heard a great entrepreneur in Utah, uh, Ray Norda, uh, make comments similar to what I have adopted as a personal philosophy and it is that you really only have three choices when it comes to change. You can fight it and die because you'll be overcome by events. Uh, you can accept it and have a chance or you can lead it and prosper. And I think that's what our state has done. I candidly think historically that's what the United States of America has done is that we have led change. And the question isn't what we've done in the past. The question is, what will we do from here on? That's the first part of my conversation from Sunday edition on KSL 5 TV over the weekend. And Governor Levitt has uh, published his memoir. It's available online for free. You can go to levitthistory.com. 
Uh, I personally believe this should be mandatory study for everyone across the political spectrum, by the way. This is just good governing, good leadership principles, uh, to be sure. And so we talked about a lot of these different gears, those big gears that the governor, uh, former governor, uh, talked about uh, and how they actually apply today in terms of good principles and good public policies. Uh, one of the things that I have always admired uh, about the former governor of the state of Utah, the 14th governor of the state, former secretary of health and human services under the George W. Bush administration, uh, is that he's he's really a leader's leader. He's, he has followed a creed that I think has just been abandoned, uh, but is one that is so instructive and so indicative of those who rise to real leadership, legacy kind of leadership. Uh, the old saying goes that uh, it is... From uh, obedience comes humility, and from humility comes discernment. Now, here's the important part. From discernment comes insight, and from insight comes foresight. And I think one of the things that former Governor Levitt is best known for is his foresight, his ability to see around corners, strategically see off into the future, and then to figure out how do you connect all of those dots to execute complex legacy-creating initiatives. We're going to stay with the conversation with former Governor Mike Levitt. Again, uh, he's been part of some crucial conversations here in the state for a long time. And this idea of past is prologue, looking at where we are today, where we were about 25 years ago, the lessons and principles that we should be applying to make sure we are successful in the future. We'll continue that conversation coming up next. Think again on Inside Sources with Boyd Matheson. Going to a jazz game is more fun together. Host an unforgettable night at Delta Center with colleagues, friends, families, whoever. Group tickets are the best way to get everyone together to cheer on the jazz. Pick from a variety of options for seating, dining, and game day experiences. Start planning your big night at the game by calling 801-355-DUMP, emailing group sales at utahjazz.com, or simply visiting utahjazz.com slash tickets. The last thing you want in the morning is more noise. The day's just getting started. Maybe you're feeling a little anxious or overwhelmed, and it's not even 8 yet. So catching up on important news stories, some sense of weather and traffic, it shouldn't be stressful. Get a wrap on the day ahead from smart, inviting voices who know you're trying to ease in. Do you love a rainy day? I do, actually. I do, too. Tim and Amanda, mornings from 5 to 9. They have you covered on KSL News Radio. Tim Jr. here from RGS Exteriors, and I'm proud to tell you, we don't lay off employees when things get tough. During the pandemic, we didn't let one of our installers go. Instead, we had them clean and remodel our offices so they could still get paid. Remember the 2008 housing crisis? It was a financial nightmare for even the biggest contractors. Still, we didn't lay off a single worker. Nope, we sacrificed profits to keep paying everyone. Look, when the economy's down, Most contractors are quick to lay off their workers. It's the easiest way to save money when times get tight. But at RGS Exteriors, we're loyal to our people. You know why? Because it's the right thing to do. People first. People always. That's the RGS way. For gutter, siding, windows, and more, call RGS Exteriors at 801-280-3110 or visit rgsexteriors.com. That's rgsexteriors.com. 801-280-3110. Hey guys, meet Salt Lake City's favorite men's health expert. Hi, I'm Eric Ramos, healthcare provider at Revive Men's Health. I've been treating men suffering from low T and ED for over five years. And before that, I was a combat medic in the Army and a Navy corpsman in the Marine Corps, responsible for my men and their health every day. I understand firsthand the health challenges that impact men. Many of my patients come to me because they've noticed a lack of energy, loss of strength, increased belly fat, and even depression. Low T can impact your whole life, but so can proper treatment of it. And hearing that my patients are back to living life to the fullest, that's the best part of my job. Guys, if you're looking for affordable, guaranteed low-T and ED solutions, contact Revive for a free T-check and exam today, saving you $199. Call 801-263-7777. 
That's 801-263-7777. Or visit revivementshealth.com. Spring is in the air, but so are airborne allergens like tree pollen, grass, mold, and ragweed. If spring allergies keep you trapped inside, then you need Navage Nasal Care to keep you breathing clearly and enjoying all the beauties of spring. Navage helps clear nasal passages that are often clogged because of seasonal allergies. Navage gently flushes a pure, refreshing saline solution through your nasal passages to clear out congestion, sucking out that springtime pollen and other irritants trapped in your nose. Navage springs into action quickly, helping you breathe more clearly in just 30 seconds. And you don't need a never-ending cycle of decongestants that can leave you feeling drowsy. Navage is the fast and easy drug-free allergy solution that helps you breathe easier, sleep better, and feel healthier. Get Navage today so you can get outdoors and enjoy your favorite springtime activities. Navage is available online at navage.com or in stores at Walmart, Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, and Target. Navage, N-A-V-A-G-E. Breathe easy. Jeff Kaplan. I'm energized by breaking news. First of all, because it's right now, and second of all, because in many cases, the audience needs to know. There's no more important service that we can provide, and I find it critically important to get more details to the audience as quickly as possible. There's nothing more energizing than that for me. Not at all. The most important thing we do is breaking news. I am gratified that so many people listen to me every afternoon on KSL, but what they don't know is that there are so many people behind the scenes making it happen, checking on the traffic, answering the phones, making the calls, talking to the newsmakers. They're out in the street, into the field to get the raw information and then putting it all together so that I can sit in front of a microphone and be a source of information every afternoon. But there are so many people who make it happen. That's what you don't know. Ride home with Jeff Kaplan. We Days, 3 to 7 on KSL News Radio. Social Security is with you through life's journey from birth to retirement. As your life changes year to year, so do your needs. For over 80 years, Social Security has helped to meet your needs and is committed to improving access to the services that make a difference in your life. Today, you can verify your earnings, estimate your future benefits, apply for retirement manage your benefits, and even change your address, all from the comfort of your home. Social Security's online services help put you in control with secure access to your information anytime, anywhere, allowing you to spend more time with family, friends, or simply just enjoying the day. Social Security, securing today and tomorrow. See what you can do online at socialsecurity.gov. Produced at U.S. taxpayer expense. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bonas. First, a two-alarm fire pushed residents out of an apartment building in Kearns this afternoon. Second, Utah's public colleges will all have tuition increases this fall, but the state's technical colleges will not. And third, former President Trump won a round in a New York appeals court today, but he was told by a different judge to be ready to go to trial in that case just three weeks from now. 45 degrees, mostly cloudy in Salt Lake City. Back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Get deeper insights on the news from Inside Sources. Well, if you're just joining us, we're staying with my recent sit down conversation with former Utah Governor Mike Levitt. This appeared over the weekend on KSL TV Sunday edition. And Governor Levitt has recently released his memoir. It's available for free online. It's levitthistory.com. As I've said before, I will say it again, I think it should be mandatory study, uh, not because it got everything right. And it's not a kind of look at, hey, we did all this, aren't we awesome? It's all the lessons learned, the good, the bad, the ugly, what could have been done better, what should have been done different, uh, and then some important lessons in terms of learning from the past and then having the leadership vision to execute it in the future moving forward. That's the real test. Now, uh, Governor Levitt was part of a, a real crucial conversation this last week at a policy forum hosted by the University of Utah's Kem C. Gardner Policy Institute and the Deseret News. And it was all about applying some of those big gear lessons that we talked about in the previous segment. Uh, and I think those are the important components that we've got to start driving towards. So I asked former Governor Levitt what he was thinking more than 20 years ago as Utah prepared for the Olympic Games to be hosted, of course, in 2002. And here's how he described it. Very early, I recognized that the Olympics was 
an astonishingly large complex event, but it lasted 17 days. And we needed to use the seven years leading up to the games as a period of time where that back pressure of having the world come here um, could be utilized. I mean, someone said, thank heaven for deadlines or nothing would get done. <laughs> that gave us a powerful deadline. It was the basis on which our highways were reconstructed. And candidly, everyone got better at things. We had to be better. We learned we could compete with the world and win. We got better when they got here. So that was, I think, lesson number one. Yeah. Recognize that a major part of the opportunity is between now and then mm. to just get better. Mm. I think a second part was to realize that we needed to use the thousand days after the games as an important time of improvement as well mm. economically. And so when we began to form the games plan, we weren't thinking just about the 17 days. We were thinking, what is it we want to accomplish economically in the next thousand days? And we invited guests who could help us, uh, who could move businesses here, or who had technologies that could be valuable. We were working to build our reputation in a way that would allow the, the benefit of the games. And so I would say those are two lessons yeah. that we should take away. Don't waste the next seven years <laughs> just getting ready for an event. Yeah. Use them. Yeah. For the t way to make the state perpetually better. Oh, I love that. And I love that whole idea of that we get so target driven in our world today. We, we hit some of the Olympics, the 17 days of the Olympic were a great target. Uh, but you have to look at that punch through. What do we want to happen the next thousand days and, and after that in terms of, of vision? Uh, give us some application of those same principles as you look at areas like education where we are where we are, but uh, we're going to be creating things for jobs that don't even exist yet. How do we go about that? I think one of the major lessons I took away from my time in service, public service is that you have to be very cautious about what it is you measure. Mm -hmm. Because real progress comes in the competencies that students develop and, how, yeah. way they, and the ways that they can apply it. Yeah. It's very easy to get caught up in the context of just a factory model where we're putting students, whether they're adults or children, through a process and we're checking boxes as opposed to what do, what are we aligning our education with there's a certain value in education just for citizenship mm. but it's also critical for a, a good economy mm. and so are we preparing our children and our adults yeah. for the economy as it's going to be yeah. not as it has been yeah yeah, that next step is is always uh, what that's about. One of the other things that you often talk about is the, uh, we actually use this as a model with my grandchildren now, and that is the absolute predictability of consequences. <laughs> uh, you've seen that from a leadership standpoint, and what happens when you don't lead or that you just hit the target uh, or you squander that time, and many feel that Utah is in that moment, quickly becoming not just a crossroads to the West, but a crossroads to the world but right now seems to be pretty pivotal uh, in terms of our ability to do that in the future. I'll, I'll use as an example um, an initiative that I look back on as one of the most important things we did. We called it the engineering initiative. It was an effort to multiply the number of engineers that we uh, developed in our colleges and universities. We realized that we couldn't do that and simply focus on colleges and universities. We had to change what happened in high school and in junior high school in order to do it. Over the course of that, uh, of the last 25 years, it, I was told the other day that they have now graduated 60,000 engineers in Utah collectively in that period. That has a powerful impact on the, in, uh, uh, on the uh, capacity of the state to prosper. Now, the question is, what now? Because what we were preparing those 60,000 for is changing with AI and with biotech. And are we being intentional enough about what's coming to prepare? And I've suggested maybe it's time for a, another engineering initiative or something that begins to drive us to a very well thought out objective. Mm, so important. Just in our uh, last 30 seconds, give us a leadership principle we all ought to be thinking about as we look to the future. Well, we all ought to remember that leadership 
in whatever form it comes, is a generational relay. We all build on what other leaders have done, and a big objective of all of us should be to leave it better than we found it and to give it all we have. That's my conversation with former Governor Mike Levitt. Appeared on Sunday edition over the weekend. You can check, you can check that out at ksl5tv.com. And uh, so many important principles in there uh, that I just love. I love this whole idea that you can't just hit the target. Uh, that's, we hit that all the time in society. We become very target-driven. But leadership happens on knowing what comes next. I remember in Washington, D.C., people would be all obsessed about a speech that was going to be delivered by a senator or a member of Congress, and they would think that's the target. And I would always say, no, the speech is not the target. The speech is just a thing, and you can hit that. That's fine. But the question is, what do you want the conversation to be the next day? What do you want the conversation to be the day after that? What policy initiatives come as a result of that and so on? And so you have to have this punch-through idea uh, rather than just a target idea. And I think Governor Levitt pointed that out, that we, we have to be looking beyond. And so if we're looking, for example, at the Olympic Games in 2034, we can hit that target. We can put on a great 17 days of the Olympics, but it's got to be past that. So we can't squander this time trying to hit a target. What we really need to do is to build something that will be a legacy for the future. I think that's a really important leadership principle uh, and lesson that we can apply to so many different places uh, in the world today. Uh, I also love how the the governor talked about uh, some some of these concepts in terms of this being a relay uh, and that leadership really is a relay. You get to do it for a season, but the season ends. And so you come in, you go like crazy, you make a difference, you add value, you leave it better than you found it, and then you pass the baton, you move on. Uh, if you go back to our conversation from earlier from Carson Holloway uh, and uh, his conversation down at Utah Valley University last year, last week, uh, all of that was about how do we leave it just a little bit better, not just in terms of politics, but in terms of policy uh, that will create great legacy uh, for future generations. All right, we'll step aside for some bottom of the hour news. More inside sources coming up next. Dr. Joshua Dunn's going to join us for a crucial conversation. Stick around. We'll be right back. We hope you have the right app on your phone for news. You probably have dozens. But the KSL News Radio app, well, it makes our live stream super easy. Plus, our talk shows are right there as podcast for your workday. That's the app for KSL News Radio. It's 2.30 at KSL News Radio. I'm Dan Bonas. KSL's top local story this hour. A lot of people had to leave their apartments in a hurry this afternoon when a two-alarm fire broke out at the Thorncrest Apartments in Kearns. This is just a bit south of Kearns High School. The fire is out now, though, and no one was injured. The cause of the fire is under investigation. A man in Iron County thought he'd found a great way to get through traffic. Utah Highway Patrol says he installed red and blue lights on his truck. The lights were in the grill of the truck. Other drivers on I-15 say he was flashing them and getting other drivers to move out of the way. Troopers stopped him near the Beaver Iron County line, and he's also now facing drug possession charges. Our top national story this hour from ABC News. Russian President Vladimir Putin is blaming Ukraine for the massacre at a concert hall outside Moscow. A radical Islamic group has claimed credit for the attack, but Putin said, we know by whose hands this atrocity was committed. Ukrainian authorities say they had nothing to do with it. Your money at this moment, the Dow Jones average closing trading today down 162 points. The Nasdaq down 44, the S&P 500 down 16. And our KSL weather, we'll see some uh, showers on and off for the next day or two. That's uh, coming up. KSL News Time 231. Are you tired of yo-yo dieting? Are you thinking about trying the latest fad prescription drug with their long list of possible serious side effects? Most people don't realize that while you may lose weight, it's just temporarily suppressing your hunger so as soon as you get off the drug, your frustration and your weight could come right back to haunt you. At slcfatloss.com, we know the secret to quick weight loss and most importantly, safe and lasting weight loss. Our program has helped over 40,000 clients across the country break the weight loss code. Gone are the starvation 
diet plans. Our program is Healthy Weight Loss, using real whole foods and proprietary strategies to help guide our clients through their successful weight loss with a roadmap to keep the weight off long term. This is Maria Shaleos. If you're done being exhausted with the same old stubborn weight problem, Salt Lake City Fat Loss has the answer. I've lost 25 pounds in 60 days. Check out this remarkable program for yourself. Schedule your free consultation. Go to slcfatloss.com. Results may vary. Three days only. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Save thousands on hot tubs and swim spas. It's a major manufacturer's liquidation of hundreds of in-stock spas. Utah State Fair Park. Hot tubs discounted 40 to 80% to the lowest possible price. Starting at $29.99. Free professional delivery. Take possession tomorrow, next week, next month, or next season. The hot tub and swim spa sale. Utah State Fair Park. Shop over a dozen models of swim spas from 11 feet to over 19 feet. Swim spas offer low impact exercise, active family fun, unsurpassed relaxation, and installation in one day. The hot tub and swim spa sale. Everything must go. Free parking, free admission. You can't afford to miss this. It's a major manufacturer's liquidation of hundreds of in stock spas. Friday, noon to 8 p.m., Saturday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., Sunday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. The hot tub and swim spa sale. Utah State Fair Park. Visit hot tub and swim spa sale.com. Traffic and weather together brought to you by Sinclair's Dino Pay app. Save up to 20 cents per gallon. Here's Ricky Meese. In Davis County, we have a crash southbound on Highway 89 in Fruit Heights prior to Green Road at about 4th North. And uh, it is now moved out of traffic to the shoulder, but that is a very wet road surface. You may want to slow down a bit. Don't miss Park City Gallery Association's monthly gallery stroll the last Friday of each month. Shop, dine, and get inspired by supporting local. Visit ParkCityGalleryAssociation.com, supported by Summit County Tax Grants. Ricky Meese in the KSL Traffic Center. And a KSL weather, more rain and snow showers today and tomorrow. Highs only in the 40s. It'll be cloudy with a chance of showers through the rest of the week. Right now, 45 degrees, mostly cloudy. I'm Dan Bomas from the KSL Common Spirit Health Studios. Listen online at kslnewsradio.com for Utah's news, traffic, and weather station. Inside Sources. Inside Inside Sources. America's voice of reason. Boyd Matheson on Utah's home for elevated conversation. Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Welcome back to Inside Sources here on KSL News Radio. It's great to be with you today. As always, I am Boyd Matheson and You know, we can always trust our friends down at the Center of Constitutional Studies at Utah Valley University to facilitate crucial conversations with our nation's greatest thinkers and leaders. Last week, you may recall, we uh, we tuned into their First Amendment conference. We heard from uh, Matthew Brogdon and Carson Holloway about the right to assembly and the right to association. Uh, Really thrilled to have joining us on the program now Dr. Joshua Dunn, who is the executive director of the Institute of American Civics at the Howard H. Baker School for Public uh, Policy and Public Affairs at the University of Tennessee. Uh, He's also uh, published widely on constitutional law and the American courts, co-authored Passing on the Right, Conservative Professors in the Progressive University. And uh, Dr. Dunn, welcome to the program and welcome to the Beehive State. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. I love coming to Utah. Wonderful. And uh, tell us a little bit about your conversation today down on campus uh, at Utah Valley University. Sure. So I was able to speak to a class about uh, rival approaches to constitutional interpretation. You could call it a constitution war. So looked at a few different approaches, uh, roughly living constitutionalism or living in a kind of a new approach uh, called common good constitutionalism. And then how they, they all try to reconcile the use of judicial power with the, with the Constitution itself. Uh, then also was able to have a meeting with some faculty and students to talk about some of my work on uh, really on the free exercise clause and the establishment clause and how it relates to education. And so as you look at that, one of the things that you have focused on in, uh, in much of your writing is how do we create this space on college campus for that real diversity, that real pluralism that we always uh, espouse and aspire to on a college campus and, and sometimes has proven to be pretty difficult? Yeah, so I think there are a few things that universities really have to do, certainly public universities. Public universities are bound by the First Amendment, and so that means that they shouldn't be engaging in viewpoint discrimination, content discrimination. 
Um, but I think that one very uh, important thing that a public university should do is adopt a position of institutional neutrality. And that, that just means that the institution doesn't take positions on controversial issues uh, of politics, uh, because when it does that, it kind of puts its thumb on the scale of campus dialogue and discourse, uh, because then it, it, it signals to the rest of the campus that there's an orthodox position and those who don't agree with it are outsiders. And so that has to have the effect of suffocating conversation. Mm, yeah, I think that's uh, such a vital thing of, of just creating space uh, for the conversation uh, across the spectrum, having that neutrality enough where you can say, okay, let's let's create not a safe space in terms of nobody being triggered or challenged or, or having to deal with a difficult <laughs> right. issue. Yeah. Uh, that's actually the, yeah. what we should be promoting on a college campus. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, if you're going to be challenged on a college campus, then where are you going to be challenged? Yeah. <laughs> and how is that going to affect you when you leave? I mean, it's not like the real world beyond the you know, the, 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 the schoolhouse gate is going to be uh, so sensitive to, to, to your feelings. You, know? so <laughs> you need to be prepared. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, get, get into a little bit of the conversation you had today as it relates to the Constitution. And uh, we, we've been talking uh, quite a bit today about uh, the actual duties uh, of Congress as outlined in the Constitution. One of those, of course, <laughs> is doing those appropriations bills and funding the government, uh, not doing continuing resolutions. Uh, but what were some of the things that you uh, addressed specifically uh, relating to the Constitution? and directionally where we're headed. Right. So when it comes to the uh, religion clauses, uh, one of the things I think is most interesting is that for several decades, the Establishment Clause received the most attention from the Supreme Court, and now attention is switching, I think, to the Free Exercise Mm. Clause. And that signals something significant. The court is actually really working hard to carve out free exercise protection and then trying to make, I think, the Establishment Clause a a buttress in a way for, uh, for the Free Exercise Clause. And it's also moving away from some really uh, – some kind of tortured tests that had been created to, to interpret the religion clauses, in particular the Establishment Clause. One aptly named Lemon Test um, that created nothing but, but confusion uh, for, for lower court judges and, and, and public officials. So that, that was one thing that I was able to spend a lot, uh, a lot of time talking about, and I, I think it really is a, uh, a significant but perhaps uh, uh, underappreciated change in the court's jurisprudence because – some of these other high-profile decisions like Dobbs have, have uh, attracted a lot more attention. Yeah, and it's so interesting that we we do that. We end up chasing a lot of these things uh, around the margins when if we'd stick to the, the principles or the essence of the essence of the Constitution, I think everything else gets a little more clear. Uh, tell me yep. just a, a little bit uh, in terms of, of your work at the Institute for American Civics. I, I think that's such a – crucial part of a conversation we're not having in the country or not preparing our young people or our old people for that matter uh, to really engage in those conversations. Yeah, so I, I think that you've already really hit on some of the core things that we're supposed to do. One is to improve civic knowledge. I mean, we see just really dreadful results on surveys of, a, of Americans about how much they know just about the basic mechanics of our political system. So that's one thing. And we see it also with, you know, with college graduates. Uh, there's actually some evidence that civic knowledge degrades over the course of college. Mm. Uh, second is civil discourse, promoting civil discourse around contentious uh, questions and, uh, and issues. And that then leads to promoting viewpoint diversity uh, because you can't have that kind of dialogue around contentious questions if there are no contentious issues that are brought up. Mm. So, so we're trying to do all of those, uh, and there's going to be embedded in the courses that we teach, the events that we have on campus. But then we we'll also have a mandate to reach across the state as well to try to reach the general public. So creating some public programming to try, try to accomplish those as well. Uh, I love that. I, I do passionately believe that uh, America is at its best when we are a country of big ideas and open, roiling debate uh, about those, not in the partisan, uh, performative politics right. kind of way, but in a way that is big ideas. We can have big differences in those opinions as long as we have that respect uh, and that we keep bringing it back uh, to what is in the best interest of the country, what's in the best interest of society, and getting that right down to the community level. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it, that it, that's it was so deeply embedded in the nature of, of America, and it, it really is, I think, troubling to see there are so many people who are tur- turning away from the, uh, those principles. I don't think it's I don't think it's too late. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing the, doing the job that I, that I'm in right now. Uh, but it's certainly there. There are signs that there's just not the support that we need for that right now. 
Yeah, and let's uh, dive into that because uh, you do have a, a hopeful perspective in all of that. Uh, we do here as well. We think our politics is broken, uh, but America is not. Uh, I've, I've probably never been more yeah, pessimistic about the politics, but never been more bullish about the future. And a lot of that is civil society and, and community. Uh, but what is it that gives you hope? What is it that gets you out of bed in the morning to, to keep on this task? Yeah, so I, uh, there are a few things. One, like meeting with students. Like I was, I was the students today here at UVU, they're fantastic. And that you can sense that there actually is a hunger for this. And that they, I think students across the country are recognizing that they need this. Um, and so, so they want it. They just need to be provided good model, mo- models for it. So reaching students in particular really gets, gets, uh, gets me, me out of bed. Uh, but then also try to uh, use the word model just a second, doing that so that others can then see what we're doing and hopefully, hopefully re- replicate it elsewhere. Mm, love that. Uh, great stuff. Great perspective. Dr. Joshua Dunn is the executive director of the Institute of American Civics at the Howard H. Baker School for Public Policy and Public Affairs at the University of Tennessee. He's been here in the state, down on the campus of Utah Valley University, having some crucial conversations down there. Uh, Dr. Dunn, thank you so much for joining us in the Beehive State today. Uh, Appreciate your work and perspective, and uh, we look forward to having you back to continue that crucial conversation. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Again, that's uh, Dr. Joshua Dunn uh, joining us and uh, University of Tennessee and I think it is so vital that we keep coming back uh, to these simple things of how do we, in a pluralistic society, make sure that we have the right kind of space to have the right kinds of conversations. Uh, and we have to be challenged. And I love the way Dr. Dunn pointed it out, that especially, especially on college campuses, that has to be the place where there is diversity of thought. That has to be the place where we're allowing people to really challenge and bump up against different ideas and visions of how we form a more perfect union. But if all we're doing is creating sameness, that's not helping anyone. And if all we're doing is protecting everybody's feelings, we're not helping anyone. Uh, And so that's part of the test is that we have to be challenged. We have to have those open big time debates and then we can get to good solutions and we can actually move it all forward. All right, we'll step aside for a quick break. Some final thoughts coming up next on Inside Sources. Believe it or not, it's time for spring cleaning. Beat the spring cleaning rush with big savings and priority booking today. You're not the only one who's tired of winter this year. Your carpets are too. With Zero Res's platinum rated cleaning systems and environmentally friendly ZR water, they'll extract all that nasty out so your home will look and smell like a home should. With their no residue difference, it's what separates Zero Res from the competition. Just check out the 3,300 raving customer reviews online with a 4.8 Google rating and see what the hype is all about. Right now, get one room of carpet cleaning starting at just $25 with a four-room minimum. And also take 25% off all other services like air ducts, tile, upholstery, and rugs by using promo code CLEANWEEK to celebrate Utah's Cleaning Week. You owe it to yourself and your family to breathe healthy, happy, and clean. Call Zero Res right now, 801-288-9376. Or go online to ZeroRes.com and say you want the Clean Week special. Zero Res. Spell it backwards or forwards. It's the right way to clean advertising used to be simple your options were radio tv newspaper and let's not forget the yellow pages now it seems like a tidal wave of options podcast cable tv streaming ott ctv audio network smart speakers on top of that you need digital marketing for your website along with sem seo display video youtube email and all the social media platforms Look, you're the expert in your business. Wouldn't it be nice to have an expert to market you? We are Bonneville Salt Lake, the local marketing and media company you know and trust. We reach customers across all digital and social platforms and have the reach of traditional advertising available as well. We find your customer anytime, any place, anywhere on any device here in Utah or anywhere in the world. We work to optimize your results with our in-house local team of experts, providing you with qualified leads, not just impressions. Contact Stephanie Palmer at KSL for a free consultation including a complete digital audit with no obligation or cost to you email s palmer at ksl.com that's s palmer at ksl.com it's been a rough winter for sure but visitors are flocking to box elder county our feathered visitors that is bear river migratory bird refuge is busy hosting swans to swallows geese to grebes the spring migration is in full swing and all that's missing is you 
Box Elder County really is for the birds. Just a short 60 minutes north of Salt Lake, Box Elder County is the perfect place to make memories and celebrate spring, along with spending time with our feathered friends. You'll experience amazing restaurants and unique shopping. Come take a soak at Crystal Hot Springs, home to the highest mineral content of any natural hot springs in the world. Let the winter melt away as you relax and rejuvenate. Take in a theater performance at one of the live theaters or visit one of the fine museums. Visitors really are chirping all about Box Elder County. Check out visitboxeldercounty.com and see why Box Elder County is for the birds. That's boxeldercounty.com. Three days only. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Save thousands on hot tubs and swim spas. It's a major manufacturer's liquidation of hundreds of in-stock spas. Utah State Fair Park. Hot tubs discounted 40 to 80% to the lowest possible price. Starting at $29.99. Free professional delivery. Take possession tomorrow, next week, next month, or next season. The hot tub and swim spa sale. Utah State Fair Park. Shop over a dozen models of swim spas from 11 feet to over 19 feet. Swim spas offer low impact exercise, active family fun, unsurpassed relaxation, and installation in one day. The hot tub and swim spa sale. Everything must go. Free parking, free admission. You can't afford to miss this. It's a major manufacturer's liquidation of hundreds of in stock spas. Friday, noon to 8 p.m., Saturday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., Sunday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. The hot tub and swim spa sale. Utah State Fair Park. Visit HotTubAndSwimSpaSale.com. This Monday Tax Tip is brought to you by Susan Spears, CEO of the Utah Association of CPAs. If you haven't already funded your retirement for 2023, do so by April 15th. That's the deadline for contributing to a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. Making the deductible contribution could help you lower your tax liability this year. To qualify for the full annual IRA deduction in 23, you must either one, not be eligible to participate in a company retirement plan, or two, if you're eligible, your adjusted gross income must be less than 73,000 for single or head of household filers, or 129,000 or less for couples filing jointly. The maximum IRA contribution you can make is 6,500 or 7,500 if you're 50 or older. Discuss your IRA IRA deduction options with your CPA. Get the most out of your income tax preparation when you hire a CPA. Go to uacpa.org to find a CPA that's right for you. Listen to KSL on Monday for more tax tips from the Utah Association of CPAs. Any Hour Services free furnace sale is going on right now. If you haven't scheduled your free estimate yet, do it now. Call Any Hour Services today or schedule online at anyhourservices.com. Mom and Dad used to argue about everything especially about dad's drinking. It drove me crazy. It got so bad, I couldn't do my homework. I couldn't concentrate. I absolutely refused to let any of my friends come to our house for any reason. I would have been humiliated if anyone found out how much my dad drank and how loud my mom screamed at him. My family went from totally crazy to quiet, calm, and even peaceful. The only thing that happened is my mom started going to Al-Anon family groups. Her relationship with my dad really changed. I asked mom if she would take me to her Al-Anon meetings or to al -Ateen. I wanted to see if I could have a better relationship with my dad. I'm sure glad I did. If someone's drinking troubling you, you might be surprised at what you can learn in an Al-Anon or al -Ateen family group from people just like you. Call 1-888-4-AL-ANON or go to alanon.org. Two friends taking pictures of the rising full moon on a summer night. Two teenage kids doing what teenage kids do. When a stranger with a gun and a death wish changed everything. It was violent, it was senseless, and I will never understand it, I will never accept it. I'm Amy Donaldson, and unfortunately, we're all too familiar with stories about how violence shatters lives. But what we rarely see is how they are rebuilt. In a new podcast, The Letter, we relive tragedy, but only so we can hear the rest of the story, the struggle to reclaim lives, the realities of grief, and the possibilities of forgiveness. I believe in miracles. Sometimes I thought, there are no miracles. Yeah, there are, and this is a big one. Follow The Letter at theletterpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. With the three things you need to know this hour, I'm Dan Bomas. First, 
No one was injured when a two-alarm fire broke out in an apartment building in Kearns. Lots of people, though, forced out of their homes. Second, a guy in southern Utah put red and blue flashing lights on his truck. They helped him move right through traffic until the highway patrol caught up with him. And third, Russia's president blaming Ukraine for the massacre at a concert hall outside Moscow. Right now, 45 degrees, mostly cloudy in Salt Lake City. And back to Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. Hear elevated conversation on crucial issues. Boyd Matheson on Inside Sources. Welcome back to Inside Sources here on KSL News Radio. It's great to be with you today. As always, I am Boyd Matheson. As we round out the program today, of course, uh, many people have been talking about the fact that of the two major party candidates, the current president and the former president, 70% of the country is not excited about a rematch of 2020 as we roll through the 2024 election cycle. And we've talked on this program about people like uh, uh, JFK uh, Jr., uh, RFK Jr., sorry, I should get that right, (laughs) and his independent candidacy. We've talked about no labels and their potential fielding of a candidate to challenge And there is another candidate who is joining the fray that could be interesting to see if they get any traction. The candidate is literally anybody else. That's correct. Literally anybody else. Now, you may be thinking, well, yeah, that's who I want to vote for is literally anybody else. Uh, You would be with about 70 percent of the country with that sentiment. But there's actually someone in North Richland Hills, Texas, uh, Army veteran Dustin, I should say form, the uh, formerly known as Dustin Eby, uh, legally changed his name and launched a race for the White House. So his legally changed name is literally anybody else. So we'll see how many uh, states he can actually get on the ballot, but I think that would be fascinating to see if people had a choice on the ballot and it listed the name, literally anybody else, uh, how much of the vote that would actually garner, especially in 2024. Now, it's ironic uh, that it is literally anybody else. Imagine the fun the press would have with that, is quoting the president, literally anybody else said, Uh, There could be a lot of very interesting things that you could go down there. I'm sure Jeff Kaplan will have a minute of news about literally anybody else. I'm I'm doing a triple dog dare throwdown for Jeff. (laughs) Uh, And Jeff is coming up here at the top of the hour, and I'm sure he'll explain literally anybody else. Uh, But it's also interesting. You may recall uh, we often refer to uh, an old uh, story uh, about uh, everybody, anybody, somebody. And now we have literally anybody else joining the fray. And, of course, as the old story goes, uh, there was a a time in the country when something needed to be done and everybody was sure that somebody would do it and anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. And somebody got angry uh, because it was everybody's responsibility and everybody thought somebody would fix it, but nobody asked anybody. And on and on the story goes uh, until ultimately there's there's a crisis and nothing happens. And while anybody could have done it, somebody would have done it, everybody should have done it, but in the end, nobody did it. And we see a lot of that. Uh, We've actually talked a lot about that today as we've talked about Congress finally funding uh, the government with a continuing resolution. This was not doing their job the way they're supposed to do their job. This was another kicking of the cans down the road. We've now kicked both the cans to September 30th for last year's funding. Uh, and remember, the fiscal year ends in September. And it's one of those where there's a lot of shoulder shrugging, shoulder shrugging, uh, finger pointing and placing a blame because anybody, somebody or anybody could have done it. But now, literally anybody else uh, is in the fray. And maybe that's where we ought to be looking. Now, we were joined by Utah Representative Blake Moore, uh, who is one of those somebodies who's been doing some things about it, uh, actually has some important bills in front of Congress, one of which would require the focus on all of the spending that nobody, nobody votes on. So whenever we hear about this funding of the government and these big political battles about what is and what isn't in those spending packages, you have to remember, this is so important, you have to remember almost 75% of the spending that the government does 
is on autopilot. Congress doesn't even vote on it. And it includes programs like Social Security and Medicare. It includes the interest payments that we make on our $34 trillion of national debt. And so nobody even votes on it. Congressman Moore has actually put forward a bill that would require Congress to actually vote on all of that stuff. Uh, because that's how you get to the serious conversation. Eric Bame joined us earlier in the program as well, talking about Social Security and saying, look, it's it's not serious. Nobody's serious about taking on that challenge. Why? Because the moment someone puts forward a serious proposal, the politics kick in. And so there was, everyone knows and everyone agrees, Social Security will be insolvent sometime in the 2030s, early 2030s. Everybody knows that. But everybody politically is pointing fingers and placing blame and saying, hey, we can't touch that. We're not going to do that. And the moment anyone tries to make it solvent and extends the life of it, they get attacked, sometimes by members of their own political party. And so a proposal was, was put out this last week. And immediately the White House said, oh, those evil, awful, horrible Republicans are going to push Grandma off the cliff and they're going to kick Grandpa to the curb. And what they're really saying is, no, for those 15 years from now, uh, the the age at which those benefits will be available is going to go up by a couple of years. That would do a lot for a lot of folks. That would make it solvent. But nobody wants to have that because everybody is obsessed with scoring the political point today. Started in the White House, Democrats in the House and the Senate, Republicans in the Senate all attacked it. Why? For political purposes, because everyone is unserious about having a serious conversation about the finances in this country. And we know the math always wins and the absolute predictability of consequences, they come, and they will come. But hopefully, somebody will step forward and lead.